The Antonine Plague, also known as the Plague of Galen, was one of the most devastating pandemics in the history of the Roman Empire. Occurring between 165 and 180 CE, the disease had a profound impact on the stability of the empire. But how did this disease arise? And what did it do to the body of someone who was infected? That's what we'll explore in today's video. The origin of the Antonine Plague is closely tied to the Roman military campaign against the Parthian Empire in the east. General Lucius Verus, co-emperor with Marcus Aurelius, led the Roman troops during this campaign, which aimed to expand the territories of the Roman Empire and subdue the Parthian Empire, located in the Mesopotamian region. In 165 CE, the Roman legions sacked the city of Seleucia, one of the main cities in the region, located in Mesopotamia near the Tigris River. It was from this event that the plague began to spread among the Roman troops. Contamination probably began due to the Romans' contact with the inhabitants of the city and, more crucially, exposure to the precarious hygiene conditions that characterized the wartime environment. Since the Roman troops were far from home and in constant contact with the natives of the region, the disease may have spread through rats, insects, or possibly infected humans. The spread of the Antonine Plague was facilitated by the well-developed network of roads and trade routes of the Roman Empire, which connected the most distant regions of the empire, from Rome to Asia Minor, through Egypt, and all the way to the frontiers of the Germanic world along the Rhine and Danube rivers. These routes, which had previously facilitated trade, communication, and the rapid movement of legions, now served as channels for the dissemination of the plague. After the campaign against the Parthians, the Roman troops returned to Rome in 166 CE, acting as the main vectors of the disease. The contagion spread rapidly through the main cities of the empire, striking Rome, the capital, with full force in the same year. The city, with its enormous population and high concentration of people from many parts of the empire, was an ideal place for the epidemic to grow. Over time, the plague spread throughout the Mediterranean and Western Europe, reaching regions such as Gaul, Egypt, and the frontiers along the Rhine and Danube rivers. The nature of the plague, together with the movement of soldiers and merchants, meant that it spread not only through the great cities, but also to the most remote regions of the empire, devastating populations in both urban and rural areas. The most detailed description of the disease that has survived comes from the famous Greek physician Galen, who was in Rome during the outbreak. He observed and treated many of the sick and left records that became the main source for understanding the symptoms of the disease. Galen wrote that the Antonine Plague manifested with high fever, accompanied by vomiting and diarrhea. These initial symptoms are common to many severe viral infections and are often signs that the body is in a state of crisis. However, the most dramatic and characteristic symptoms of the disease were related to inflammation of the pharynx, which caused breathing difficulties, and to the skin eruptions. Galen mentioned that in the skin eruptions, pustules or papules, small blisters, initially appeared as red spots, but many of them turned into black ulcers. This specific symptom became a distinctive hallmark of the disease, since the blackening of the ulcers indicated that the skin tissue was dying, a process of necrosis that compromised the integrity of the skin and led to serious complications. The skin eruptions caused by the plague were particularly dramatic. Beginning as small red spots or papules, they developed into blisters that grew large, filled with fluid, and over time could turn black, suggesting a very severe secondary infection. The change to black in the ulcers can be attributed to the death of tissue, a consequence of an extremely aggressive infection that damaged blood vessels and led to necrosis of the skin. The visual impact of these ulcers was likely deeply disturbing for those who witnessed or suffered from the disease. Based on Galen's descriptions, modern historians and epidemiologists suggest that the Antonine Plague was probably an outbreak of smallpox, a highly contagious viral disease with symptoms compatible with those Galen described. It is an extremely serious disease with high mortality rates. Another possibility, although less likely, is that the epidemic was caused by measles, which can also produce skin eruptions 
and symptoms such as fever, diarrhea, and vomiting. In any case, both diseases were unknown in Western Europe at that time, which means the empire had no natural immunity to them, something that contributed to the severity of the epidemic. The effects of the Antonine Plague were not only immediate, but also long-term for those who survived. The permanent scars left by the disease, especially on the face, were a visible mark of physical suffering and secondary complications such as extreme dehydration and secondary bacterial infections contributed to the high mortality rate. Furthermore, many survivors likely suffered damage to internal organs due to the collapse of their bodily functions during the most severe phase of the infection. The Antonine Plague did not spare even the highest leaders of Imperial Rome. Co-Emperor Lucius Verus died of the Antonine Plague in 169 CE, and many historians speculate that Emperor Marcus Aurelius himself may also have fallen victim to the plague in 180 CE, although the exact cause of his death is uncertain. Estimates of deaths range from 2% to 33% of the population of the Roman Empire, with some historians suggesting that up to 25 million people may have died as a result of the epidemic. Cassius Dio reports that the city of Rome lost up to 2,000 people per day during the peak of the epidemic, a shocking number that shows how severe the impact was. Rome, as the administrative center of the empire, was not prepared to deal with such devastation. The streets, markets, and homes emptied out, and the survivors faced the trauma of seeing thousands of their family members and friends die from a disease that had no known cure. The Roman army, which was at the heart of the military campaigns in the East and in North Africa, suffered enormously from the loss of its most capable forces. This not only diminished Rome's military strength, but also affected its ability to expand and maintain control over its vast territories. At the height of the epidemic, Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who was already facing leadership challenges and the need to deal with constantly threatened frontiers, saw his authority tested by the plague. Marcus Aurelius, in particular, was forced to take drastic measures to maintain the strength of the army. With the loss of so many soldiers, he had to resort to emergency solutions to fill the ranks. As a desperate measure, Marcus Aurelius recruited soldiers of questionable origin, including gladiators, slaves and bandits, to form new military units and continue the defense of the empire. Economically, the plague had a huge impact, with the shortage of workers affecting agricultural and industrial production. Cities like Rome were depopulated and trade routes were severely disrupted. The Roman population, already under great pressure due to constant wars and the high cost of imperial administration, now faced the harsh reality of a devastating epidemic. The massive outbreak began to subside around 180 CE, when the pandemic, by its very nature, started to lose strength. Over time, the number of people susceptible to the disease decreased, making it harder for it to spread and eventually causing the mass outbreak to die out. Despite the end of the pandemic, the plague left behind a weakened empire and a traumatized population. The death of Emperor Marcus Aurelius in 180 CE, which coincides with the decline of the plague, is often seen as the end of a golden era and the beginning of a period of turmoil that would lead to the crisis of the third century. So if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel